Well, hello, friends. Ryan here, professional life coach, Enneagram educator, and your host for this episode of Forward Bound with the Enneagram. You know, the Enneagram is a powerful tool for building understanding, compassion, and achieving growth in our lives, grounded by nine types or ways that our personalities and egos are structured. The conversations in this podcast are designed to illuminate the Enneagram in action by hearing directly from individuals who are working with the Enneagram and their type in their lives. The views reflected in these conversations are personal, and so what one person shares may not be true for all others who identify as their particular Enneagram type, and that's okay. My encouragement, listen with compassionate curiosity. Thanks for being with us. So today we are moving close to Enneagram type one. This is often referred to as the perfectionist. And my guest today is my good friend, Krista, who identifies as a type one. Krista, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Life treating you well today. Things are going well and it's wonderful to be with you as well. Well, it is a special treat for me, Krista. Um, Krista and I have known each other for a good while, and we have actually been a part of Enneagram work for the majority of that time uh, together. And so I know this is going to be a rich conversation, and I really appreciate you making time for it. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share. Krista, if it's okay with you, I'd like to start just with a short uh, introduction to the type for folks who are listening along, and then we'll very quickly get into a conversation about your experience uh, living with and leading with type one. Does that sound good? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Let's take a look together at Enneagram type one, often referred to as the perfectionist. We start by looking at the instinctual center of intelligence for the type. This could be head, heart, or body. As a body center type, along with types 8 and 9, the type 1 leads with this grounding, a physical embodiment that is instinctual, arising from their gut center. Individuals who lead with type 1 tend to experience and process the world primarily through their physical body and instincts. These are action-oriented individuals who are focused on achieving tangible results. Leading from the body center, type 1 exercises top-down control of their impulses, often resulting in physical rigidity or tension. The perfectionist embodies a worldview that is about making things orderly, fair, and just. A primary focus around noticing what is wrong and a drive to do things the right way. A belief system develops for type 1 the sense that by being good, acceptance can be assured that by personally taking action, what is wrong can be made right, and that personal worth follows as a result. Two primary driving attentions emerge for type one. We'll refer to those as reform, and then resentment, or anger. First, let's look at reform. It is this notion that the world can and should be improved. The type structure is driven by an almost constant monitoring of situations and a sorting of actions into what is right and wrong. A strong sense of personal responsibility undergirds this drive. Often the voice of the inner critic loudly and frequently calls toward perfectionism, both for self and the external world. Individuals who lead with type 1 may be drawn to activism or social justice work, often highly principled and committed to their values. And now, let's look at this experience of resentment, or anger. Think of this as the response to an almost never-ending preoccupation with reform. At times, the response may be explicit, and at other times, repressed. Anger may be brought to a head through a slow-burn response at all that is wrong, perhaps at the delay of productivity as a result of being engulfed by all the details. Perhaps it is resentment at the work-first, play-later mentality that the type structure reinforces. A notion that attending to personal needs and pleasures might open the floodgates to unending impulses that will detract from what needs to be fixed. Perhaps the anger and resentment manifests at self, in acknowledgement of the ways that the pursuit of perfection has led to rejection or alienation by peers or loved ones. 
And now we look at what we call the virtue for the type, this highest expression of their potential. Think of it as keeping all the gifts for the type and then also uncovering or remembering a piece of truth that has been forgotten along the way. For type 1, we refer to the virtue as serenity, the state of inner peace and calm that comes from accepting the imperfections of oneself and the world. It is a quality of being that is free from judgment and self-criticism. The work here is about allowing all of the reactions and responses to people, situations, and the environment to move through the body without being inhibited by the thinking self. A reconnection to holy perfection, the truth that our fundamental and absolute existence is already perfect, that we belong and are loved and accepted simply by virtue of our being. So I think it is important to share before we go any further that this is just a place from which to start. Uh, you know, everything in that recording may not resonate with everyone who leads with type one, and that is okay. Um, but Krista, I want to invite you into the conversation. And I'm curious, just, you know, an open-ended thought to, to kick us off. What re what really resonates with you today, um, based on what we've just heard? What sticks out to you most? Um, the slow burn, mm -hmm. the acknowledgement of anger. I like to I like that you know that you said slow burn because that's what it is uh, for me, and the constant you know how we lead with the body or the doing center, um, and how that can really and repress thinking how the doing can really be exhausting. And uh, the Enneagram for me has played a role in my life around mindfulness of how I lead and personally as well as professionally. So those are the things that kind of um, stood out for me as well as the work first play later because mm. I used to be an, a workaholic and the Enneagram has helped teach me to move into, for example, my high point, which is the seven and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I want to dig into some of those uh, in a little more detail, but I wonder maybe if we could pivot for a minute, because I think sometimes in these conversations, it's easy for us all to see the Enneagram as this system that points us in the direction of all the things that we need to change about ourselves or all the ways that we need to grow as individuals. And there is some truth to that, but there's also an, an acknowledgement, I think, of the ways that our type structures offer gifts to the world. And so when I say to you, Krista, you are an individual who is full of gifts, how does that land? And what are some of those? So yes, there are, there are a lot of gifts that, um, that I believe type ones bring and, and that I bring. Um, one is really around responsibility, integrity, uh, truth telling. And, um, you know, a friend said to me <laughs> recently, uh, you know, you do, you do the non, the non sexy work, the work that others don't want to do. <laughs> and so, and others have said that as well, you know, like you, um, and so those are kind of the gifts that I think that we bring, we bring order and structure, mm -hmm. um, but also support and encouragement. So I think those are the gifts that we, that we bring. Yeah. Yeah, and I see that play out, of course, firsthand just in our relationship with each other. And so if we could sit with this notion of responsibility for a minute, where do you think that comes from, Krista? Like, why does it feel important to be so responsible? Because someone has to be responsible. Mm -hmm. I think it comes from my childhood, being there for my mother and my sister, but also, you know, a responsibility to myself to be, again, perfect, even though there's no such thing as perfect. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the responsibility comes from. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Krista, really. Um, and what I hear in that is that this, this notion of responsibility being a gift, but also a really prevalent theme in your life isn't something that is new. It's something that you track back to a very young age and that is really still with you pretty strongly today and every day. Is that fair? Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, 
you said something in the as you were sharing about the the sense of personal responsibility you feel even to yourself yes. yeah sometimes we talk about that is this voice of the inner critic is that mm-hmm. is that re- does that resonate oh yes oh, oh yes. yeah <laughs> uh the inner critic uh in the past um for me was very very strong it's the you aren't good enough or this could have been done better or even if I made a mistake, I used to act like the world was coming to an end and I would be viewed as bad or not good. But yes, the inner critic is always like, has to be better, it has to be right. And really, well, what is right? Yeah. <laughs> um, as I've learned. But yes, the inner critic is very prevalent. Um, however, I've learned to quiet the inner critic um, and it's really through the work of the Enneagram. Yeah. I want to talk about how you quiet it. So help me remember to to come to that next. But b- before we jump there, I think most folks who are listening probably resonate with some degree of this voice that says, you know, we, we talk about imposter syndrome or, you know, the, the negative self-talk. And so I think a lot of folks will probably find some common ground with that. I'm curious, for you and leading with the type one, is that something that happens periodically or in particular situations? Or is it is it more sort of just everyday experience? In the past, it was, sometimes it was based on experiences, but for me in the past, I felt like it was every day. And mm-hmm. now it may come up as it relates to different, to different situations. Yeah. You know, and also I will say when I did my, did my strength finders, harmony is also my number one strength. So when you have, so when you have harmony of trying to make sure everything is okay, some people Mm -hmm. may say, I want to make sure people like you. And then you counter, then you also have the one Mm -hmm. of perfectionist. It can it, that can it, feel like a conundrum, a conundrum. Yeah. Yes. yes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I love that you bring that in because you know we don't talk a lot about strengths finders on the podcast, but I mean, generally speaking, I'm of the opinion that these strengths are things that we develop, you know, over the course of time. Whereas the enneagram really points to an instinctual pattern that we that we you know come into early in our life. And so, you know, you're in a position, Krista, professionally, where harmony is actually really important. I mean, doing whatever you can to to achieve that and maintain it. Yes. Um, And so that makes a lot of sense and is an interesting perspective. Um, And I I could also also like to say, even with my strengths, it's harmony, responsibility, discipline, (laughs) consistency. Okay. (laughs) All of those things really, for me, connect back to the one as well, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, and sometimes folks who lead with type one will share, you know, and we talked, you mentioned early about the slow burn really resonating, Mm -hmm. but this relationship with anger being a paradox in and of itself, because there is this burn at, you know, injustice and fairness, things not being right. But there's also a notion that anger in and is in and of itself also wrong. And so mm-hmm. an unwillingness to really lean into that because the appearance of it is not something that would go in the category of right. I mean, does that resonate? It does. It does resonate. Um, and I'll also say as a Black woman, you know, I have to also be very mindful of the narrative of the angry Black woman. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I have to be very mindful of. But yes, I mean, it is a slow burn. We Ones will tend to slow burn about an issue for a really long time Yeah. until it comes to a point where it comes to a head and we just, you know, go go off. But um, yeah. the other thing is with the one, the slow burn is we want to fix it. That's one of the favorite things I think about being a one is we we get shit done. We know how to we we take action. Yeah. Um, but however, if we have a slow burn about something and we can't find a way to fix it, that kind of int- intensifies it. Mm-hmm. And people aren't doing what we think they should be doing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I'd like to first, actually, before I go on, thank you for acknowledging just the cultural context that is overlaid and your experience through that. And I think this is really important for folks who are listening, especially if they are considering navigating what their type is or what others around them are. Um, and there are all sorts of ways that I witness uh, behaviors and the intersection of behaviors and culture playing out in really problematic ways. And so, um, you know, you mentioned specifically thinking about the type one, and as you said, the angry black woman. And I think we really have to be mindful and careful about how we move about thinking about behaviors and culture and, and how all that plays out. So thank you for sharing You're that. Welcome. Yeah. Um, how, how common is this, you know, sort of categorizing of right and wrong? I mean, is that a, is that a pretty, is that a pretty comfortable natural place just to, as you're moving about day to day in situations, sort of scanning and, and thinking that's not right. That's not right. Uh, there you go. That's it. That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. However, I've learned, I guess everything that I think is, is right or how to, how to fix it doesn't have to be my way. Mm -hmm. I do. I am constantly scanning about something that is not happening or I don't think it, I think it should happen route A instead of route B. Mm -hmm. um, so I do provide um, my perspective on things. And I'm very careful about how I um, address whatever topic. But yes, I mean, I um, it's it's all around me from politics and things that are going on right now in our country to even home life with my children um, right. and schoolwork and things like that. Yeah. And I hear you, you know, saying I'm at this point in your life, you bring a sense of care around how you approach these issues when they arise. And, you know, good for you. That's that's development work. That is is a good focus of attention, I'm sure. But one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, for folks who are listening, the tendency is when you see something that needs to be fixed, there is a willingness to move to action on it. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. Every single time. Yeah. Even even if it's not your responsibility to do it. Yeah. You yes. Yeah. And how much of it is, you know, I'm just thinking about again, folks who might be listening and thinking, well, that sounds like me or that feels like me. And you know, we talk to the two and the two has this willingness to move to action, it's generally toward helping someone, you know, providing compassionate care to someone. You know, the three is really quick to move to action, but that's generally in pursuit of receiving some level of acknowledgement or being seen as successful. For the one, this is really about moving to action to fix what is perceived to be wrong. Is that fair? That is that is yeah. correct. That is yeah. correct. And we and we move because we're frustrated. Yeah. At what we it is that we are seeing. Yeah. And because you believe that you can affect the change on it, like you have that capacity within you. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Mm -hmm. um, you've shared a couple of times, you know, about uh, practices that you've developed or an awareness that you've developed that helps you manage some of these tendencies where they may not be serving all that well. What would you share with us about practices that you've developed that help move you out of this tendency to move directly toward reform or to help manage around, you know, as you've said, the slow burn, the bubbling up of anger and resentment? One question that I constantly ask myself and that has helped me tremendously is the question of how long do I want to be in this space? Mm. Because for me as a one, it can be very exhausting mentally, physically, emotionally. And so really asking myself that question, how long do I want to be in the slow burn around a particular issue? How long do I want to continue to feel this way? And so that's one practice um, that I do also, one big thing with the one is, um, I'll say our antidote is patience. I always say my oldest son, Gavin, who does have ADHD, is God's gift to me to work on my patience. Hmm. Because as a one, we do have ideals of how we think life should be or how we think, you know, no one thinks, oh, I, 
I never thought that I would have a child with ADHD or I never thought I, my child would have, you know, food allergies to soy, eggs, peanuts, and tree nuts and Mm -hmm. having to read labels and all of this stuff. But it it has, it has let me, it it has allowed me to just give myself grace Mm -hmm. to be easy with myself and to really acknowledge, well, Krista, this is what it is. And we're going to have to eat, just move with ease get Mm -hmm. rid of the rigid because again how long do you want to be in the state Mm -hmm. um to be able to move with ease because in the end i can't control everything Mm. yeah those are those are um those are kind of the the things and the other thing that i've been working on is to help me out of the rigid really on well i say professional and personal but really on the professional side is you know, the possibilities, because as ones, and for me, very head down, boom, 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 and never have a chance to take a step back and kind of imagine or dream. Mm -hmm. So trying to do that and imagine the possibility. So Mm -hmm. that's why, for example, a four, which I know you are, and I have some fours on my team, the way they approach me, if we're talking about something to say, they use the language, well, what if, what if this, or what if that? And so that helps me kind of get out of the rigidness and the yeah. anger about something to imagine, uh, to imagine something different. Yeah. And I'm glad that there are fours in your life who can help do that. It's also a reflection of you moving Krista into seven, uh, yes. because the, you know, the seven, uh, that is the world that the seven lives in is the world of infinite possibilities and opportunity and, and dreams. And so that is a Very really, high, yeah. And, but also a really high and good place to develop, you know, the capacity to spend some time there. So good for you. Mm-hmm. You say um, that you have this question that you ask yourself, how long do I want to to be here? How long do I want to stay here? What happens in order for you to even know that it's time to ask yourself that question? When I can catch myself starting to get angry, or if I realize I have been slow burning about an issue and it just starts to affect me again in different ways, emotionally, Mm -hmm. mentally, physically, just the exhaustion Mm -hmm. allows me to, um, to be in that place. So for, you know, one example is, dealing with a situation at work where an external entity is really, in my opinion, doing some things that are inequitable and um, not really sharing the reason why things are happening and has had a major imp- an impact on, on the organization. And I really allowed that to consume me my first year of running the organization um, and was slow burn about it. But then I realized my second year of leading, which I'm in right now, you know, I can't control, I'm never going to get the answer as to why this is happening, the, the real answer, but I really know the answer, but I'm never, they're never going to say it. And I really just can't control what it is that they do or, or, or put my energy towards what is going on externally. Mm-hmm. I can only focus on what it is that I can control, which is what is happening in the organization, what is the work that's being done, et cetera. Now, I do call BS on when the external <laughs> organization is talking about us or doing X, Y, Z, but right. but that's just an example where it, the first year I was just so just trying to figure out why and asking why and what's going on, mm-hmm. and I just had to release that. Mm-hmm. And so it was really me asking, like, how long do I want to be in this place and swirl on an issue where I'm never going to get the answer. I'm never right. going to know why. So let me, let me shift my energy into something that really makes me happy, makes me excited. Yeah. I can put my energy towards that. Yeah. And you know, this, obviously it's a big deal because it is, I mean, I'm, I think familiar with the situation that you're referring to and without getting into all the specifics of it, it's a big deal. I mean, yes. it is, it's pivotal for the organization that you're leading and, you know, from the outside looking in, it appears that there's a whole heck of a lot of wrong that yes. is driving that situation. And so yes. I think it is understandable that someone in a leadership role would want to fix it, but certainly an individual who leads with type one, I mean, this has been big, this has been big work for you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, this movement, Krista, that we hear this shifting to, you know, what's possible, what's possible, what what can be done, where can where is a, a useful uh, exertion of energy and, you know, that that is a good place. So yes. What would you say to folks um, who are in close relationship with a one and who, you know, maybe are are witnessing some of the some of the ruts that, you know, the one can come into? Um, what is a way that folks can support the one in their life? Own your stuff. Mm. <laughs> just own it. If you made a mistake, just own it. Be on time. Don't be late. <laughs> um, explain the why behind behind something. If you want to influence us or to move something, explain, you know, instead of just saying it, uh, explain the why and know that if we're providing feedback, I, I know people will think it comes across as criticism. We're really trying to help. Like mm. we really lean, well, I really lean on my two wing of being helpful and the Enneagram has given me a tool, again, of mindfulness of how I approach, like the language that I use. The other big thing is for for, for um, is for people to encourage us, which I'm grateful to have around, is encourage us to take time for ourselves and to unplug. Mm -hmm. Because, again, when you're in that fixer mentality, um, you will work yourself to the bone. And so rest is extremely important and really leaning on the helping helping us get to our seven yeah. um, is really important so encouragement to do that is helpful for us yeah and i'm so grateful for you to bring in this um clarification of like when things appear critical like what's really going on under the hood i say on this podcast like let's listen with compassionate curiosity because what we witness day to day is behavior from other folks that is coming at us and we don't often stop long enough to think where is that coming from and so someone may be witnessing someone in their life who they believe leads with with type one and it's gosh why is everything so critical why is everything so critical but you've said beautifully this is really coming from a place of wanting to be of support and assistance right Absolutely. um and so what happens when we shift the perspective on what we believe is going on for someone you know as, as a powerful way of of being supportive in those situations um we're almost out of time krista but i'm curious before we wrap up just to maybe Talk, share a little bit more about what this journey to taking time for yourself and self-care has looked like. Um, what are some helpful ways that you have found to incorporate that into your experience? It's really about prior. I've, I've been on a journey of reprioritization or prioritizing. Mm -hmm. Um, there was one time, this was before Gerald, my husband and I had children. He's a four. I want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Um, he has identified himself as a four. Okay. Um, you know, he, he said, you know, when you come home, you say hi to me and then you go upstairs and then you go right back to work. Mm -hmm. I was never really aware of that. And for him as a four, the feeling center, which they leave the field, um, maybe they're like, okay, I'm working too much and I'm not, you know. And I think also with with children, I mean, they're growing up really fast and I, you know, I need to spend as much time with them as possible. However, to your question, um, which is really about me, I really am intentional around how I am, how I unplug and when I unplug. So that looks like coming home. Yes, I'll cook dinner, but instead of getting back on the computer, I don't get back on the computer and I watch, you know, Abbott Elementary or some of my favorite shows. Mm -hmm. It would it would be uh, taking naps on the weekend. I'm a huge advocate of the nap ministry and Trisha Hershey's work. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm still on a journey. I don't have it down to a T, but really saying, you know what, it's going to have to wait. Mm -hmm. And I think that's me giving um, care for myself. Um, because ones tend to overextend themselves until they hit a wall and they're mm -hmm. just exhausted. So yeah. I can't really take care of others unless I'm taking care of myself. So yeah. that's why I'm very grateful of those that are beating the drum to me about, are you taking time off? Are you taking your PTO? All of that. 
Yeah. So I'm hearing maybe that's even a way that folks might be able to support the one in their life is to be a helpful, gentle reminder that it is okay to take a little time Absolutely. for yourself. The work because, will be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've known you to schedule your, your, your you time. Yes. Yeah. Because it won't and, get done. <laughs> Well, right. And I think like, let's, there's no shame around this. It's like, let's use the gift of the type, which is around creating structure and order to yeah. also to get what you need. Because as you say, you can't pour from an empty cup. So if we need to work within order and structure to schedule time for self-care, then do it. You know, that's a, that's a good and beautiful thing. And I have learned that from our good friend, uh, Catherine, who identifies as a six. She used to tell me all the time, just book it, Krista, because you're never you're never <laughs> going to do it. If, if you book it, then it's scheduled and you'll get it yeah. done. I yeah, have you'll get it done. I adopted that practice thanks to her. Nice. Well, Krista, before we say goodbye, this conversation was much too short and flew by much too fast. What other good morsels or nuggets of insight might you share with us before we part? I think... While someone is trying to figure out uh, what type their type they are, there are a few questions that I that I thought about of if someone's trying to figure it out. Um, one would be, you know, do you feel frustrated at others that don't do what you do? Mm. Are you detail oriented? Mm. Do you have a heightened inner critic? Do you repress anger? Do you have a fear of feeling bad? Do you hold yourself to high standards? Are you sensitive to criticism and are you a fixer? Do you think that everything can be improved? And I think those um, questions will also will help someone kind of identify. And if you are a one, it's okay. It's oh great. yes, it is okay, and it's a wonderful thing. Yes, I'm. Embrace no it. one's no one's gonna see the way we're smiling, but maybe they'll hear it in our voice, but that's right. That's right. Yeah, thank and, you for saying that. If you are a one, good for you. Absolutely. And the thing that I've learned uh, through one of books is we are all one and perfect as we are. So that's another thing that has allowed me to yeah. release um, and get into serenity and patience. Yeah. Well, Krista, this has been a joy. As we move into future seasons of the podcast, my hope is to bring some folks together across different types and talk about, you know, what we have in common, what we don't, how we intersect. And so I hope maybe you'll be on standby for a return visit. Absolutely. We'd love it. Okay, good. Well, until then, uh, be good to yourself, okay? It was really great to be with you. Thank you. You too. Thanks All right. for being with you as well. All right. See you, Krista. Okay. Bye. We hope you are taking away a new learning or insight today, maybe about yourself, someone in your life, or both. If so, time well spent. And if you are ready to explore this work on a more personal level, I invite you to be in touch. Visit us on the web at forwardbound.com. That's F-O-U-R-W-A-R-D-B-O-U-N-D.com. There you can learn more about our coaching and Enneagram education work and schedule yourself for a free of charge discovery call. Finally, we look forward to welcoming you back for another episode of Forward Bound with the Enneagram very soon. Again, thanks for spending this time with us. Be well. <laughs>